All right, so we're live. Uh, I am Brandon Jones, psychotherapist by profession, uh, writer, behavioral health consultant, uh, resident of Minnesota, of all places. And we are here once again with another evening of Drop the Mic uh, with my co-host, Brian. Brian. You can introduce yourself, sir. Brian Edwards, uh, my treasury analyst by trade, um, soon to be a, well, actually an owner of a financial advising company. We'll soon to go live with that stuff in the next couple months. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm broadcasting out of uh, Houston, Texas, of all, all right, places. So from, so from the bottom of the U.S. map to the top, from Texas to, to Minnesota. So yeah, man, you got your more us shirt on. I see you representing. That's what's up. Yep, yep. Um, more us app uh, should be coming out in the next couple months. I think there's going to be a beta testing with it, and uh, what they're doing a lot of tests right now. It was this app was created by uh, the uh, Tariq Nasheed. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, he wanted to stop the censoring that's being done whenever we talk about black empowerment. So he wanted to to make a platform for that, and so this should be tight, man. Whenever it comes out, everybody should get it. Right. So. Dope. Dope. All right, man. So, yeah, it's been an interesting 48 hours, 72 hours, or however you want to look at it. Um, t- t- share with myself and the folks that will catch this later, uh, what have you noticed? What have been some of your responses? Um, how you feeling? Being a black Honestly, man. Honestly, I mean, here's the thing. If you really do your studying on what exactly white supremacy is, and how it works and what, you know, the results of it is going to be, this really isn't come to too much of a surprise. I'm not, I'm not shocked. This has been going on for decades after decade, after decade, after decade. You look at the history of the black man in America, the the black woman in America, you look at those, that history, this, I mean, there's been brutal rapes. There's been, you know, riots where, you know, people would protest and then you had the federal government clamp down on our people. You There's been, you know, um, uh, uh, massacres of our people. This is comes to no surprise. I mean, during, even during the civil rights movement, the cops were aiming for our people. I mean, we know what the police were there to do. They're, protect, they're there to protect property and they're there to, you know, now keep us in line because we're no longer property. So, I mean, this is this is not a huge shock. I think what the reaction that I've seen from more, most black people have has been shock. And my thing is, I'm like, and one girl put, oh, well, now it looks like it's open season. No, it's always <laughs> been open season. Amen. Where have you been? Where have you been? I mean, Brandon, this is just especially I mean, OK, so I was about to go to sleep because I was, you know, I was reading about the, the thing that happened in Baton Rouge. Which is a state over, and I've been to Baton Rouge. Um, it's it's a I, I like I like Louisiana. I like that I like Southwest Louisiana. Like my my fiance's family, they're from that Southwest Louisiana, Baton Rouge. She has an aunt that lives there. It's not a bad place. I never actually felt. Um, I mean, of course, I've never been stopped by the cops. You don't want to be stopped by Louisiana cops ever. I mean, because first of all, you're gonna end up with a ticket. <laughs> right. So or it's just it's just I just never was stopped. I could, right. you know, in New Orleans, it's probably about maybe an hour away. So it's not a big deal to them. But right. I was about to, so I read about all that stuff that went down there. And then as I'm about to go to bed, I just happened to see Roland Martin kind of shoot out a Facebook post talking about somebody is videoing live um, as their boyfriend is getting shot by the cops. So then I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. What's going on? So let me click on it. About 930. This is I mean, I don't know. I think it's happened around that time, exactly around that time in Minnesota and or a little shorter before. And then I turn on and I'm like this lady sitting in the car. The dude is slumped over. Blood is coming on his shirt. And the lady sitting in the car talking about, hey, my my boyfriend was shot. He told the cop he had a gun, which he is legally which he's legal to carry. And, you know, um this is just an injustice. The cop is sitting there still pointing the gun inside the car, even though the guy is obviously about to die at this point. And he's just telling, and then you hear him on the camera because I think he realized it was live. You hear him say, Hey, you know, we've got a, um, 
you know, hey, we've got a uh, – he, he t- I told him not to reach for it. I told him not to reach. I'm like, really? Really? And then the girl the girl says back, no, officer, you told him to reach for his license, which I really believe the sister there because, I mean, that was just so subtle the way that, it, that things kind of went down. And then as it continued going, I noticed I didn't realize that there was a four-year-old in the, sitting in the back seat of the car. They right. got the sister out. Through the through the phone on the ground, you see the phone kind of lying there, but you hear everything that's going on. She's crying, saying, "Oh Lord, please, I hope my boyfriend is not dead." Then you hear the little girl saying, "Mommy, I'm scared." I mean, I'm a, I was just livid to see even hear. I was sickened to see all of that. I mean, I have a five, I have a, a six year old niece. I'm like, that could have been, you know, it, it's just ridiculous. And why would you fire into a car with other people in the car? I mean, this is. It's just it's just sickening. And then, you know, like I said, the Baton Rouge incident, that's sickening as well. You had two big fat cops laying on one one person. okay? then all of a sudden one of them rolls off of him and starts and then just loads this fires away. That's ridiculous. (laughs) Talking about they were scared because of of a gun. Hmm. But that's my that's really my thoughts on it. I'm, I'm just I'm I'm I'm. Shocked, but I'm not surprised. Right. And, you know, it's interesting that you make the statement that you're shocked and not surprised. So I think that's where a lot of black folks are as far as our response. It's shocking because, um, especially for folks here in Minnesota, it's shocking because it's happening right in our backyard, right? Roseville is about 20 minutes from where I'm at. Um, Roseville is like 10 minutes from where I pretty much grew up at. Uh, so it's shocking because it's happening right here, but they're not surprised because it continues to happen to black folks around the globe. And, and one of my goals in the work that I do is to help black folks understand that we are global people. You know, I go by the, the handle online is Universal Jones because that universal stands for we are global people, you know. We're not just subjects to our cities, our blocks, and, and the states that we come from. Like we, we are global citizens, and we have to understand that. And we also have to understand the system that we live in, racism, white supremacy, is a global system. Absolutely. I've seen a lot of people today talking about we need to get out of here, start our own stuff, like we're going to run away from the influence. Or go back to supremacy. Africa. People have said, let's right. go back. I'm like, Africa is – have you been over there? They've already Most people been. haven't been there. They, they've already been. <laughs> Most people haven't been there. Most people haven't now. read any literature coming out of Africa. <laughs> Most people haven't seen any television shows or any media out of Africa. They have no clue. They just believe that it's something that we could just run to, and that's not necessarily the truth. Uh, it sounds good in theory, but in practice, it's expensive as hell to go to Africa, one, just to visit. And two, a lot of folks don't. Um, actually, no, where do we connect with Africa? I mean, we have to be a, and also, and, and I'm going to say this, uh, I didn't say this earlier when I was Facebook living, but running away from our problems is very weak stance. That's my belief. I believe, I believe saying that we're going to go back to Africa is kind of weak. That that's that to me is a defeated mentality. That's saying we can't do anything here, so let's run to the next place, not understanding that there's a system there as well that we have to combat um, and that we have to actually understand how does that system work and how does that work being an American black person? Because believe it or not, black folks in America, we do have a kind of class representation when we leave this country. And, and we, and most people that haven't left this country don't understand that they just say, okay, this person's black. So I'm gonna go. And if we're going to be honest, it's funny because Mr. Nilly Fuller Jr. Says this all the time. A lot of Africans, they're trying to come over here. <laughs> he, always uh, yeah. says that. he always says that. He's like, look, we talk about running away from running to Af- the continent of Africa, which is a huge continent, the hugest continent in the uh, world. First, and, and a lot of folks from Africa is trying to come here looking for opportunities. So what makes uh, you know black people in America think that running to Africa is going to solve the problem of racism, white supremacy? That's not true. Um, so for me, uh, I believe that you know, it, thank you, Janice. Yes, four hundred years of investment. You don't have to abandon it. You have to claim and seize it, and that's what I believe. Absolutely, we have to seize our opportunities, and it starts local where you're at. Most people, and we talked about this on the last lab that we did. Most people don't. Un, most people don't know who their local government is. We can't even seize our local communities. We don't know who the mayors of our towns are. We don't know who people are 
We don't know the people that are controlling our water, the people that are controlling our electricity, nope. who's operating the grocery stores in our communities. We don't understand who, who actually owns the houses and the apartment buildings in our communities. And if we don't understand that, how are we going to go anywhere? How are I mean, we going to combat police brutality? Basic things. I mean, thank you. There's from basic a things that we have to get. From a political right. standpoint. Right. And and Dr. Leonard Jeffries talks about this, um, and I hope I don't get this wrong, but he says, in order for black people to gain liberation, we have to control three things, politics, education, and economic. I think it's economics. Economics. I think it's, three. I think it's yep. politics, education, and economics. And I agree with that. And it goes along with the same, the same things Dr. Amos Wilson, who is my idol, I mean, he he has literally climbed number one to my big one of my biggest influences next to Malcolm X is Dr. Amos Wilson. Most people do not know or talk about Dr. Amos Wilson, but it's the same thing he says. It's the same things that Dr. Claude Anderson says. It's the same things that um, Dr. Uh, Francis Chris Welsing was pretty much saying. Like all these people are saying this. They've provided this framework, this blueprint for us to follow, and more. Most people don't have a clue who these folks are. Uh, and and that is what. But they don't. Williams. We have... <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Uh, no, they, uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Really I'm kidding. I'm no, no, kidding. We, can, we can go there. <laughs> hey, hey. At this point in time, we can go there because you know, I don't want to. But I don't want to bounce around too much. But no, I know, I know. The, I'm just kidding. But with go the Jesse ahead. Williams things, <laughs> and if, for folks that are listening, if you have questions, uh, you can you can jump in and speak if you want to. If you're yep. If you're looking right and you want to get on camera and you're cool with that, you can definitely jump in or you can just write in a question or a comment on the side. And um, I, me and Brian will definitely be willing to uh, share our thoughts on there as best as possible. So don't be shy. Don't be a spectator. Uh, definitely you can contribute if you like to. Um, if you do want to come on camera, please have on headphones. <laughs> yeah, have on, <laughs> headphones, have, have on headphones. Have on headphones. <laughs> otherwise, we'll get a lot of background noise, which we yeah. learned last time. It's yeah. not a good thing. So any, any headphones. They could be raggedy. They could be purple headphones. It doesn't matter. Just have some headphones on. Um, but Jesse Williams, yeah. So it's interesting how all this stuff just kind of flows, right? It's interesting how Jesse Williams makes a statement. You know, the media attention's all over Jesse Williams. You know, we got the, you know, the typical racists saying their little, you know, comments about what he said and calling Memo him Becky. a racist. Yeah. <laughs> right. <Becky. laughs> yeah. 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 Like, like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, we get these things. And then literally a week later, leak, a week later, we run into July 4th, which is, <laughs> which is my birthday, which is always an interesting time for me. Um. And we have folks, you know, celebrating Independence Day, getting their USA outfits. You know, my, my daughters had USA outfits on because their grandparents put them on there. It was not my decision. I wasn't in the state at the time. You know, it's, it's things like this, right? So we, we have this we have this kind of connection to being Americans. But at the same time, we don't have the respect of being Americans or humans, actually. And, and that's a very, you know, it's a very, I'm trying not to use too many mental health terms, but it's it's almost a schizophrenic place to be, right? So we have this. We have people in the media telling us this is good. You know, Jesse Williams is bad. He shouldn't be saying these things. He's anti-police. He's anti-white. And then we have a holiday that's supposed to represent our, our quote-unquote independence. And then, boom, we have one video of a black man being pinned down by two two white officers and murdered on the scene. And mm -hmm. then not even 20, what, 26 hours later, right here. Another one. You have another black male who was being compliant. <laughs> he was being compliant. From what we've heard, he has been compliant. And boom, he's get shots dead right in front of his girlfriend and, and, uh, and her child. But I said their child because it sounds like he was being a father to this child. Um, four years old man i mean the trauma that we go through is it hits on so many different levels you know it it's not just you know it's not just the the personal it's not just the personal trauma that we go through as individuals like being beaten being cussed at you know going through traumatic stress being raped 
um, you know, see domestic violence, things like that. It extends into how we are treated as a collective as well. And what Dr. Joy DeGruy Leary calls post-traumatic stress um, or post-traumatic slave syndrome. Um, it goes right into that. And, and the black and our, I think one of the things that I say about black culture is black culture has been a response to racism, white supremacy. And hmm. I think that's black culture ac across the world, but especially here in the United States. And unfortunately, the thing, the, the way we eat, the way we have sex, how we communicate, how we build families, how we educate our children, the things we tell them, the things that we don't tell them, the way that we interact amongst each other, the way that we look at business has all been a response to the system of racism, white supremacy. And, and, and that is and that is a traumatic response. So mm -hmm. if you want to be honest about what black culture is, black culture is it's a response to trauma. Yeah. It's not anti-white. No, nah, it's, really, it's really a acceptance and a response to anti-blackness. Gotcha. That's what black culture is from the from the language that we speak, from the religions that we worship, from, you know, how we interact, where we live, why we live, where we live, how we live, the way we live, from the clothes that we wear, from the clothes that we choose not to wear. It's all in response to living in a system of racism, and white supremacy. Same thing happens with Jesse Williams. So we have a person who has a white parent and a non-white parent, and he is classified as a non-white person. So if we're going to sit here and talk about him being light-skinned and him sharing his message, you know, that's really not necessarily the biggest thing for me. Now, for some people, it might be, and that's cool. But for me, that's not the biggest thing because mm -hmm. he's still seen as a non-white person. Yep. I'm pretty sure white people do not classify him as white. Now, there are mixed, quote-unquote, mixed race, biracial, multiracial people who can definitely pass for white. I did a documentary on this in 2008. I should redo that documentary because it was not in HD. I think well. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, my, and my intellect and knowledge has taken so many different levels that I'm pretty sure if I go back and watch, watch it, I'll be disappointed in a lot of things I was talking about. But that's life. Um, but... But he's not a he's he's classified as a non-white person. And I would go and I would even further say that he's classified as a black person and he spoke truth. And one thing as black people that we have to do is accept truth for where it comes from. I think a lot of white people say a lot of truths. And and and, and me understanding the system of racism, white supremacy, I always side eye that truth. I make sure, you know, I'll take the truth, but at the same time, I have to have an understanding that where is this information coming from? And I think with Jesse Williams, he has a track record and you can check his receipts and see that he's been doing this. So I don't think that we should bash him for having a white parent. Oh, I never said um, he I never said he but, should have been bashed. No, I ain't saying you. I'm, but my I thing is, it. my thing is, you black people it. should have listened to this a long time ago. It all goes back to what I said about when you let entertainment. I'm sorry. It all goes back to, to, to what I said about when you let entertainment run who you are as a person, who you are as a culture and who you are as a people. It's when when you let when you do that, you I mean you you're the people like Amos Wilson, the people that like you know um, um, Neely Fuller, the, the Tariq Nasheed, all of that, those people that are preaching the message of racism, white supremacy, and what you need to do, the Malcolm X's, and what you need to do, all that's gonna go, all that is going over people's heads. My thing is, why the hell did you wait till Jesse Williams say something to say something to accept the, the message? And if you've accepted the message, then that then the acceptance is going to be met with with action. I feel like, you know, we've have a lot of people out here that are, you know, saying, yeah, you know, what he said was great and we should empower, empower, empower. We can talk about empowerment all day. But the thing is, without action with that, with that, it's not full acceptance. So anyway, go back to what you're saying. <laughs> no, I agree. Uh, you know. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. I'm just reading comments. Yep. And and I agree. I agree that actions are, is important. And and I go by this quote um that I like to share with the people the young people that I work with is actions is the greatest truth. What you do is always going to be more important than what you say. And what you do is always going to be more important than what you think. However, your actions are instructed by your beliefs. Absolutely. And if you believe 
that you can't do anything and you can't change anything, or you believe that running to Africa is going to solve your problems, then your actions are going to be weak. <laughs> and that's where we get a lot of misleadership. I see that being put in the comments. That's where we get that from, because the quote unquote leadership has beliefs that we are in an integrated system and we ain't integrated nothing. And, you know, it's frustrating because here in Minnesota and just kind of where I'm being positioned as, as a 30 year old black male is frustrating because, you know, we have, we have, we have folks that can be considered quote unquote gatekeepers. I'm just going to keep it real. Um, we have folks that, you know, that have come here. Most let me just break down some history on Minnesota real quick. So most of the black folks that live in this state are not people that have been here for very long. So mm. we, I mean, a lot of the black folks that live in this state have been here for just a few, maybe two generations, if that. Uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to have a family that's been here for about four, going on five generations. If you ask, if you add my children. Uh, mm. So we've been here for a while, but most black people have not. A lot of black folks come here for economic opportunities, whether that is to get a job at one of the Fortune 500 companies that have been here or whether that's to get uh, some type of government assistance, because we are seen as a Midwestern state that has great benefits to help people out. So when that what, what happens with that is it creates two different dependent mindsets which is very dangerous so when you get folks that come here for economic opportunities which i don't disagree with they definitely should that's how my family originally got here a lot of the um you know steel mills and um various different organizations and operations that were happening because of the mississippi river that's how my family got here um and I don't necessarily knock anybody for doing that because we need economics to solve our problems. So um, so you got those folks. So that creates kind of a middle class, right? That creates kind of a class where people are getting money. People can get back in the 70, 60s and 70s, people can get jobs with third grade educations making $18 an hour working at factories. Like that's significant money. Yep. But what ends up happening is when those jobs, when those factory jobs flip over and it turns into service industry jobs, then we start to and then people start to lose their jobs. It creates a whole nother it creates a whole nother system. And then what ends up happening is and then drugs are brought into our communities. Guns are brought into our communities. Gangs start to form late. And then we start getting people hooked on social services. Um and, and that creates another dependent mentality because now we have, we're like three generations on people that have been on WIC food stamp section eight. And when people are on those three things and they feel like, you know, service of living off those three things, they're not going to change any habits of inferiority. And that's very dangerous, right? So we see this. So this is what happens. So you have black folks who come here to get jobs working for Target, General Mills, 3M, all these companies, right? And then you have another huge population of black folks that come here looking for op other different types of economic opportunities, which is uh, social services, pretty much. And what ends up happening is these two groups end up furthering and continuing on generation through generation, creating their, these mindsets. So we have a divide here within the in the Twin Cities. Right. So why am I I'm bringing this up because I'm watching all these live streams and these videos uh, from the aftermath of the shooting. Folks are, you know, down by the government, the governor's mansion. Uh, folks are talking about various different things. And now both of these groups are in the same place. But the, the, th the reason why this is important is because both of these groups don't have the same agenda. Mm -hmm. That's why this is important. Mm hmm. The leadership class, which is the quote unquote middle class, and really they're the working class because they ain't got no money. That means most of them don't have real money, wealth. Their agenda is to maintain their position, mm -hmm. right? The poor folks, the folks that ain't got a lot, their agenda is to be heard, right? So neither one of those agendas are on the same path. So therefore, nothing's going to get done. And this is why I keep telling folks. If you do not come together and understand your collective situation is that you live in a system of racism, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. You live in a system of racism, white supremacy. And that's the focus is how do you dismantle this system? Not how do you maintain your position or not how you need to let these people know how angry and mad you are. They already know that they get both of that. This system wasn't set up overnight. They get that. <laughs> 
They got us figured out. We've been talking about the same stuff for the last almost 60 years, man. They get that. They get it. They get it. And their system is so well oiled and so refined. They don't give a damn if you're protesting. We can shut down highways all day. Guess what? People still going to make it to work the next day. <laughs> Unfortunately. They still, no, they, guess what? There's still going to be somebody, that, another that's going to be a hashtag the next day. Unfortunately, we have to understand that. So the folks that have a little bit of money that consider themselves to be middle class or gatekeepers or whatever, those folks need to understand that they are just pawns in the system. And then the the folks that ain't got a lot of money need to understand the same thing, that they're just pawns in the system too. And we have to build from there. So I've been trying for the last two years or so to bridge those gaps. And it's been hard as hell because I've been tapped as a person by black folks and by white folks in, in Minnesota as one of these up and coming black leaders in the Twin Cities. And it's an uncomfortable position for me to be in as a black man and as a therapist under, having an understanding for what racism, white, white supremacy, supremacy is. is. Yeah. Having an understanding for what racism, white supremacy is and still trying to do the work. Um, so, it, I mean, it's frustrating. And and yes, you know, Jan, Janice is right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have to get back to the basics, educating, feeding our communities and building a village, our homes. Absolutely. And just like Mr. Nilly Fuller Jr. says, we have to start off with a united, independent effort. We definitely do. And that means taking care of ourselves first, because we have a lot of stress and a lot of personal trauma that we don't necessarily work on due to the system of racism, and white supremacy. And then it, it spills onto our relationships with our spouses and then to our children if we have them. And that's how we need to look at working on our families is how are we going to work on our de-stressing our lives, living in these toxic stress agendas, build our families because families create communities and communities create economic situations. It's a, it's all a domino effect. It's all a domino effect, but, um, going back to look at truck stops, truck, truck tips question. Yes. How do people mm -hmm. go ahead? Read it. Go ahead. I was going to say, how do people understand the system? or have some understanding of it to help others understand? Or how do the two groups reconcile their agendas? It's a good question. Um, I mean, that other part, like to me, I in order for me to learn exactly, because really it was Brandon Jones that put me on this stuff that, not even just the stuff, this reality that we live in. And I mean, I just did more research, but you, you got the other person's gonna have to have an open mind. And, not, not, and to really, you know, kind of look at their react, kind of look at things from a different glass, from different glasses, and to really think about, okay, so to really think why things are the way they are and why you do things, why you start doing certain things. Like, for example, for me, um, there was there was some music I liked or different kind of women at first I liked. And, you know, I started thinking about that. I'm like, what are my re what's my reasoning? What is my, you know, why am I doing these things? What on TV? What am I seeing on TV? And you, you've really got to critically think, um, you know, black love creates black love. Exactly. Um, but I mean, you really got to think the person's really going to have to have an open mind to wanting to be to accept, you know, the reality of racism, white supremacy. Now, there's some people out there that fool themselves. But hey, you know what? Everybody's going to have their day where racism, white supremacy slaps you in the face. And you're going to realize, oh, crap, this is really real. I don't know if these shootings did that for a lot of people, you know, but some people for some people that I've seen kind of put things out there um, on online that have kind of said, oh, well, you know, well, you know, they, they make excuses about, well, why didn't the guy comply or something like that? These people shut up today. They had they couldn't say anything. And some of them would just randomly put, well, I don't have anything to say about the incident. Well, what's wrong? Why not? You had something to say about the other ones. You got slapped in the face. OK, no matter who you are, it's coming for you. That's what you need to tell that person. And um. <laughs> the come to Jesus moment. Absolutely. One thing we got to understand is that racism is attacking us every day. It's not necessarily killing us every day, but we are being infiltrated with racism, white supremacy messages all the time. 
and, and the system has been in, in a position of refinement for so long, it's hard for us to even live without it's hard for us to even live without accepting some of that, myself included. I'm talking to you right now on a platform that was not built by black folks. <laughs> you know, the <laughs> internet that I'm using for this platform, I'm paying a bill monthly for people that ain't black. All this equipment I got up in this house ain't from black folks, unfortunately. So in order for me to do the work that I need to do to help my people, I still have to rely on white folks, which is frustrating, which is very frustrating. And, that, and I believe that that is an attack on my black self-respect because no matter mm -hmm. what I do, I still have to go to them for something in order for me to get my job complete, whether that's my job being a father, a husband, a therapist, a person in the community, a black man, a brother, uh, you know, all these things. It doesn't matter because I have to go to white people. I have to go to, you know, BP or, you know, Super America to get gas. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I am dependent as hell. And that's frustrating. I'm so damn frustrated by that. And and the only way that I believe that we can change that is if we get enough people that are of like minds to understand that we have to come together to do something different, which is hard. And that goes into um, the question that was posed of how do, you know, how do people who understand the system or have some understanding of it help others understand? It's hard. One thing that I learned about four years ago, because um, I almost <laughs> I almost messed up my marriage, right? And what ended up happening? No, I'm serious. I'm, I'm gonna tell this story because this is real, and I've heard a lot of people talk about this. Um, I got married in 2012, and slightly before getting engaged, so about 2010, 2000, going into 2011, I, I came into contact with a show called The Context of White Supremacy, hosted by Gus T. Renegade and Justice at the time. And what that show talks yeah. about is pretty much non-white people getting their act together and understanding the system which we live in, which is the system of white supremacy. And when I got this information, it was so just like, revealing for me to understand like okay i'm not alone in what i've been thinking and other people get this a lot deeper than i do because i was confused i mean i was running around i was dating white women you know i was calling myself a, a male feminist and i was just i was lost and <laughs> i was lost man you know you were there for a lot of for some those, of that those, those classes really messed us up man <laughs> yeah i know damn university of minnesota but um <laughs> For real, man. I mean, I was I was seriously lost. And when I got this knowledge, and I got it by accident too, which is crazy, right? So it's funny because the way that I discovered the cows was I was searching for Tim Wise information. I and <laughs> I was searching for Tim Wise's information. <laughs> and and I like podcasts. I've been listening to podcasts since like 06. So I'm like, okay, let me see if Tim Wise has been on any podcast. So I've been I was searching for stuff for Tim Wise and Eric Michael Dyson. And uh, mm -hmm. this context like of white supremacy it. thing piped up. And I'm just like, okay, what is this? So I listened to it, and I heard this dude with a deep voice. And I thought it was a joke because he had a little girl on there. And I heard uh, Tim Wise getting mm -hmm. mad. And I'm just like, man, this is good. What, what is this? This is, this is so goofy. Um, This is so goofy. Like, why does this dude messing with Tim Wise? Like, Tim Wise is spitting that real. So I turned it off. I was like, I can't mess with this. And then I got on my Dick Gregory kick and I was on YouTube and I'm listening to everything from Dick Gregory. So I was like, let me go see if I can find some podcasts with Dick Gregory on there. And the cows pop back up again. And I'm like, let me listen to this. And then I heard the second time Dick Gregory was on and he got mad at Gus and was like, you know, don't ever call me anymore. And I'm just like, man, I can't mess with this show. <laughs> what the heck? He pissed off. Yeah, for real. <laughs> it was a journey. It was a journey for me to understand this, man. For real. I'm not joking. It was a journey for me to understand this. And then... I was searching for, then I got hooked onto the book of Dr. Joy DeGruy Leary, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And I and then I did the same thing, looking for podcasts. Where's Dr. Joy DeGruy? And this show popped back up again. So I'm like, okay, let me just give this show a chance. And that interview had me, and I'm like, let me continue to listen to this. And I heard I kept hearing this name pop up, um, Dr. Nilly Fuller, Dr. Nilly Fuller. And I'm like, who the hell is Dr. Nilly Fuller? Why do, why do they keep talking about this man on this show? And I looked, and then when I started to do more digging with him, that's when the light bulb clicked. And it was, it was about mid to late 2011. And I went head first, like most people who get quote unquote conscious 
and kind of tuned into some accurate information, we go head first into it. And I'm trying to tell everybody about it. I'm trying to educate everybody I know. You know, I'm the most rebunctious, rebellious person I know talking about racism, white supremacy. You know, everybody's out to get us. Don't trust none of these white folks. I ain't talking to none of them. I was cutting folks off my Facebook. I didn't care. I was I was 100 percent RBG ready to go. <laughs> like, like that was me. And one of the, and one of the things I didn't notice that was going on while I was consuming so much of this information is I was pushing my at the time fiance away because she wasn't getting it right away. And I'm just like, how how don't you understand this? And understand that she grew up in the suburbs and you know, you know, she didn't have any white friends at the time, but she worked with all white people because you know, when you live in Minnesota, you really got much of a choice but to work with white folks. So she wasn't really getting a lot of things that I was talking about. She was getting mad, she'd be cussing me out, like, Why are you listening to this shit again? And <laughs> just like just crazy stuff. Yeah, it was it, I mean, <laughs> it was pretty. I mean, when you when you're trying to give people accurate information that goes against their conditioning, their 24-7, 365 times however old they are conditioning they reject it and that's what she did she rejected it and we had a serious i mean it wasn't an argument but it was one of them like serious conversations where we both are just very calm and trying to talk to each other and i was just telling her like look i'm not necessarily going to change who i am um entirely but i want to get more serious about you know what i do and i stopped going out with people i cut a lot of folks off i wasn't clubbing as much and that kind of scared her because I switched up so quickly. She didn't know how to respond to that. And one thing I learned from that experience, and this is to answer the question, was you cannot force this information on people. Right. You can't because you're going up against their conditioning. We are programmed to be anti-black in a racist, white supremacist system. And you can multiply that by 24-7 times 365 times whatever age that person is that's their level of conditioning that they have and by you just trying to add in a little bit of that a little bit of correct knowledge it's hard and it's to like this day <laughs> man to this day we have gotten a lot better because she gets it i mean stuff like what has happened over the last 48 hours there's no way that she can ignore that there's no way that she can ignore that she sees the level of stuff that i get you know, people hit me up, you know, people cutting off my contracts, not want to talk to me um, because of the work that I do and that I'm, you know, I'm not willing to just be cooning and <laughs> bending over for folks like that's not me. If you want me, you'll get that real. And if you're OK with getting that real, then we can work together. And that's fine. So she she's seen it and she's been able to understand that, OK, my husband is not crazy. Like he actually understands some level to what he's talking about. Let me kind of pay some attention to him, what he's going on. So I did. I had to stop trying to force it. Another thing that I did, um, and and this is funny because I think we're gonna get some backlash with the black female who recorded the video. Um, but another thing I was doing was I was trying to force her to be conscious. So I was on her up. You need to get your hair natural. You need to cut all that permit out and all that. I, I was just like on her back about stuff. No, I'm serious, man. I, I'm not, I really did this stuff, man, and and it's wrong. And I don't I don't agree with that at all. And I, and you know, you know, I think about it today, like, damn, I was so messed up trying to force somebody to be, quote unquote, conscious that I was really pushing her away from me. And I had to realize, like, I can't control I can't control what she does with her hair. That's not my place. Would I prefer her to be natural? Sure. I like girls with natural hair. I also like girls with shorter haircuts. That's just kind of my thing. Like, I don't know. But it doesn't work to force it. And I was trying to force it on her. I was trying to get her to do this, you know, but there was a there was enough level of respect. And when I started to back off that we were able to do some things that were a little bit different, like naming our children um, certain things and, and not folding. Um, so don't force it. That's what I would say. If you want to help other people understand, you wait for opportunities like we have now where people are paying attention. People are scared. People are angry because they're more willing to listen. Now, if I would have posted my Facebook live video two weeks ago to hell, yeah, two weeks ago, it probably wouldn't have got the reach that it got today. And I got a lot of shares. I got a lot of views on that that I did not expect to get. But I've been doing my this mama. for the last. Yeah, your mom. <laughs> yes, your mom. I'm not going to give too much of her personal information, but your mom comes from a wealthy background. She's one of, she would be considered to be one of those black folks that are gatekeepers. That's where she comes from. 
That's her background. And well, that's I wouldn't okay. say she was wealthy, but you know. She was wealthy, but she was <laughs> wealthy. We can talk about where she's at now. That's a whole nother story. Because you know, <laughs> they like your mama ain't balling, brother. But but think about that. Like my reach was crazy. My reach was crazy with it. Whoa. Random little kids. Don't hide. Come here. Come here. Come here. What are you doing? You're supposed to be asleep. Oh, oh baby right. Z. Yes. So this is what fatherhood's about. This uh, is the future right here. <laughs> Baby, Hi. Justice. it's okay. All right, you better get in trouble. You better go lay down. It's okay. Go ahead, shut the door. Oh, <laughs> oh she wanted to see Uncle Brian. It's okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> she's she's so mad. Um, lost my train of thought. No, you. Oh, just... your mom. Yeah, I was yeah. talking about your mom. But we ain't gonna talk about your mom. Why you talking about my mom? <laughs> <laughs> talking about my mom. No, <laughs> but. <laughs> But you know we can't we cannot force these things, man. We can't keep we can't force somebody to understand this information. Like they have to they have to want it. And right now people want it. People are fed up. People are tired. People are scared. So they're more willing to listen. So for the if you continue to preach your message, people will come to you. There are people right now that are in my inbox, have texted me today, have called me that they know I've been talking about this stuff for the for damn near a decade now and now they're starting to come around because they understand okay brandon just ain't this black panther dude who's talking all this crazy black stuff like brandon actually has some information that we should you know we should attach ourselves to and and that's what we have to we have to be consistent so if you have some information you have to be consistent um and and don't stray and also another thing that i see (laughs) and man i'm not trying to expose this dude but not only do we have to be consistent, we have to live what we're telling people. Because mm-hmm. I seen a dude in Minnesota on on the on the live streams at the governor's mansion today talking all this stuff about how we are here and we need to stand up and yada yada yada. And I know him and I know his history, and he ain't he is not living the stuff he's talking about. He's out here doing women crazy, having random babies, smoking weed, going crazy. I'm not saying smoking weed's a bad thing, but he ain't on his. He's not on his square. And there, and and I see people po- posting him up. He's getting news coverage, and he ain't on his square. And and that type of stuff can't be happening because that makes but that's all the reason why they post him, especially as black men. That makes us all look bad when dudes like him. Yep, broke people cannot lead. Dudes like him who ain't got his stuff together because he has a label in the community. And I ain't going to say what that label is because y'all know exactly what I'm talking about pretty soon because they've been getting him on CB. I've seen him on CBS earlier when they start getting dudes like him who ain't handling their business. Is he part of the Black Lives Matter movement? Am I? No, is he the guy that you're talking about? Mm, Kind of, but not... Yes, to a certain extent, yes. He's not – so the local movement here, he ain't 100% involved, but when stuff is happening, he's around. He's around. Hmm. Jock's tip has right. a question. Go ahead. Yes, so I'm going to read the question because everybody won't be able to see or hear this. Um, So, Brandon, with the experience that you just explained, would you suggest that folks date people who have the same understanding that he or she – has or just date people who have the qualities that you like and hope that that person comes into more understanding later i'm appreciating the insight here thank you oh big question all right so we get into relationships which i'm all for because i'm a marriage and family therapist um i feel like i feel like you should attempt to date someone who has similar interest in you no matter what those interests are similar understandings in you no matter what those interests are um you should attempt but understand when you talk about being quote unquote i don't want to use the word conscious but when you talk about being less confused about racism and more honest about racism you should definitely try to date those types of people however you have to look at their behaviors i don't care if they're conscious or not always look at what someone does Always look at what someone does because their behaviors let you know who they are. Their behaviors will always let you know who they are. Behaviors will never, never fail you. Oh wow! Shots fired downtown at. at wow, we're gonna, we're gonna get on that. Now we're in, now it's in my state. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised, man. I'm not surprised. We're gonna get into that. So while while we're chatting, I'm gonna look up a link, and I, I can actually show a link to see what's going down in Dallas. But I would suggest that um, I would suggest that you look for somebody's, you look at someone's actions, and you try to find somebody who is conscious. But it's hard. It's hard because everybody, everybody is not on this level of understanding to really and ready to be honest. Um, you can you can date somebody who's not quote unquote conscious or honest about racism and hope that they come around. But I believe that if you do that and you keep trying to hope that they come around, you're gonna waste a lot of your valuable time and a lot of your valuable dating time, especially if you're a black female. And I'm be honest, black females have the hardest opportunity of dating somebody. And what I mean by that is not because black females are seen as the less attractive woman and all these other crazy, stupid studies that we see. Right. I say that because black females options of black men who are actually about something and are actually trying to do stuff is slim. So and not only that, two of them already deceased now. I mean, seriously, what, what do you expect? Two of but, them are dead. But not but not only that, Brian. Just pure, uh, just pure numbers. There's more black females than black males already, so you're already at a disadvantage just on genetics. I mean, there's more, ma- there's more, <laughs> there's more females than males. Period. I that's, mean, that's what I'm saying. Across, that's what I'm all saying. All across the board. So genetically, <laughs> you're already at a disadvantage. And then we you're talk already, about yeah, black yeah. men that are actually trying to be about something and be partners and spouses and potentially husbands and fathers, like. Man, I, I hate to say it because it hurts my heart, but there ain't a lot of us. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to say that we're I'm the best or anything, but there's not a lot of us. I see it day and day and day in and day out. And it ain't a bunch and it ain't just, you know, dudes in the hood. It's dudes that have jobs. It's dudes that are out here working. And these dudes have dusty black male behaviors. <laughs> and and so with that said, with that said, I think that for black females, if you do find somebody that is have some level of awareness, latch onto that person. You can hope that they change. I wouldn't force it, but you can try your best to do what you can do to have them look at to shift their worldview to look at the world differently because it's tight out here for black females. I get black females hitting me up all the time asking me questions about do you have any friends? Uh, yep. Where can I meet a man? Mm-hmm. You know that I do marriage counseling, and it's like, man, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like, I feel bad because I, I really don't. I, me too. All my friends are taken <laughs> by yep. black by black females, all of them. And ain't a lot my of fiance, them. yeah, my fiance's girlfriends. They they all are asking me, Brian, oh, you met Brian? He's such a nice guy. Where does he have any any friends that are single? My like, all my friends are married or they <laughs> they got fiancés. <sighs> Man, yeah. and the ones that aren't, I wouldn't suggest it because it won't turn out good. Yes. Do you guys believe that black women should date non-black? Mm-hmm. My answer to that men? question is no. I was saying yes to someone else. No. <laughs> oh, absolutely not. No. Well, but my, my, I'm sorry. My take on it is real simple. Black love is revolutionary. And that's it. That's all I'm going to say. I agree with that. But here's my, here's my I'm going to be real with this question. My, my short answer is no. My long answer is you might not have a choice but to date. Right. If you really have to. And I hate saying that. I get frustrated with this. One of my closest cousins, and she's like a sister to me. She's with a white dude. And I I believe he has the best intentions for her and her children. Um, But I wish she was with a black dude. I really do. Like I can't front and lie about that. And I'm cool. I am cool with the person that she chose to be with. I think that he's sincere. (laughs) Yes. I, I trust. I I kind of. Tr- I'm not gonna say I don't trust him. I have more trust in him than more more other people that I know. Most, most white people that you know. <laughs> but he's still white. I mean, it is what it is. And you know, there's no knock on him. They have a they, you know they have a great family. He he's treated her better than all the, the black dudes she's been with that I know of, unfortunately. Um, but that's her choice. That was her option, and that and that's one thing that frustrates me. And that's one of my goals as a black man. That is trying to help other black men is to help them as to help them find different relationships that are constructive and to actually treat women with some respect because you know is she wrong from going with somebody else not necessarily not necessarily she's not wrong here we go not necessarily okay, yo, what is this wrong. going on right here sexual messages and falls under the psychiatric system how about learning to be oh man here we go you gonna spam my page, redhead? Um, what is going on? Who are you, redhead? 
why why did you come in and split that out there? Imitations of animals are other methods used. Yeah, I'm not gonna feed the trolls. Okay, well she's gone. I blocked her. She's gone. So okay. one thing that we need to understand about this white people burn midnight oil. They don't stop in their job. Their system runs for a reason. They'll continue to troll. They'll continue to block. They will come and disrupt any and everything you have, including Black Lives Matter. Including Black Lives Matter. They will come and disrupt any and everything you have because that's a part of their duty to maintain their system. A system is run by individuals and people who are gathered around agendas and missions and are dedicated to make sure that they obtain what they have. And that's what we have with these trolls. That's what we have with the, uh, what's her name? Tommy, Tom, what's the white chick's name that was uh, talking about Jesse Williams? It doesn't matter. Her. Oh, Bimble Becky. Just call her Bimble Becky. Not, whatever. No, see, I'm not going to get into the name calling thing because I think that that's that, what it is. Yeah, sure. That's sure, a nickname. But I'm, that's not me. So I'll, I'll leave that to other folks to do the name. Calling. I don't know. I don't know her name, but she's not relevant. But anyway, but she is because people gonna pay attention to her. That's that's what I'm trying to get y'all to understand, man. Like you could say she's not relevant, but no, I'm saying her name is not real. Her name isn't real. No, 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 she no, no, no. listen, listen, listen. It don't matter what. It doesn't matter. You know who she is, even though you don't know her name. I know who she is, even though I don't know her name, because she fed into our news feeds. So she's relevant, no matter if you like it or not. This is <laughs> this is what I'm saying, man. Unfortunately, this is what I'm saying. So you have to understand that if we have to understand that I have to understand that these people will burn midnight oil to keep their system running. But we have to do everything in our power to block them and to keep it moving because we will respond to that. We will respond to any white person because we have been conditioned to seek white validation. So when a white person says something against racism, we're going to post it. When a white some when a white person says something against us seeking telling the truth or seeking liberation, we're going to post that because when white people do stuff, we react. And when we react, that leaves us in a bad situation. We're always reacting. Unfortunately. And and I do think that there is a proper place for reaction. I do. Oh, of course. However, yes. if you're just reacting without having any um, proactive, any agenda, um, any understanding on what your strategy is going to be or your tactics will be for what's going to happen next, then you're just putting yourself in a bad situation. And this is and this just isn't with racism. This is just with life, period. Um, I want to answer some of these questions. So I don't want to get too lost, uh, but I'm digging the questions, though. So do you guys believe that black women should date? Oh, we already answered that one. Uh, the short answer was no. The long answer was they might not have a choice because there ain't enough of us on point, unfortunately. Um, and going off on that too, it's go I mean going off what you said about like you wish that you know that there were a lot of options. I don't know. It just the more I the more I learn about racism, white supremacy, and, and really understand the system. When I see like, and then and then going back into how white Americans or, or Europeans have dominated cultures all across the the entire continent and across the co entire world. It, I mean, what they all they did was pretty much you, ki you killed off the men. It's what they're doing right now. It's really e it's really simple what they're doing to us here. They exterminate the men and then they take the women. That's the way I'm looking. I'm like, this is more of a domination kind of thing. Now that now that we understand how, um, you know, Dr. Francis Cress helped us understand the, you know, the black masculinity concept uh, that white people uh, kind of are jealous of. We, this, this is, this is, because these police shootings, these random acts of let's put black, dead black men on TV and show people, see, this is what happens to them, or this is what's going to happen to them. I mean, all of this stuff that's going on right now, I mean, this is all just a, a, a system that is just dominating that is taken over. And then of course, uh, for example, like when I went I, a couple of, about a month ago, I went to Savannah, Georgia. Now Savannah, it's got a lot of history. It's got a lot of, uh, especially slavery ancestors. Um, you know, th th it was a port for slaves. One of the first in the United States. And, uh, you know, when I got down there, I was surprised by how many black women were with white men. I mean, there was a lot of brothers around, 
they weren't getting any play though. The I was just like, wow, what is going on around here? But then I started thinking about the you like think about the history, the history of Savannah. They said Savannah was the only the only city that in the south one in the south that was not burned by General Sherman's army. And so these people pretty much, you know, when when, Ger- when Sherman came into to Savannah, they said, "Oh, we'll build. Not only will will, will we build you uh, uh, mansions and allow you to have. They have a, a street called Sherman's Quarters. Allow you to keep your army here. You know, we'll give you we'll give you some food. We'll give you some land. And then I started thinking. I was like, what else could they could they have offered this man that for him not to burn this city down? And I'm like, man, they probably gave them slave women too. I mean, that's just when you go down there, it, it's it, I swear that's exactly what that looks like. I'm not even kidding. And I, it was just shocking. I mean, I told you, I, I told you, you got to make it down there, man. It's 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 an interesting experience just to see a dominated area, uh, uh, a fully 100 percent dominated area where it where the area was started, where they started this system of of where, of where we came onto the continent. Um, you know, or into the North, into North America, and you know, it, it, it's it's just interesting. You you got to see that. But I, I guess looking at those those relationships, it, it, it's it's kind of hard for me to to see. And I've I've seen a lot of black women that are have been white men, kind of throw shade at a black male. But I guess that's that that's a somewhat of a conditioning and somewhat of what you called a reaction to racism, white supremacy, from racism, white supremacy, which, which equates to anti-blackness. Um, you know, so, but then there's other people that are happy, you know, your, your cousin, she's, you're right. She's actually happy. And I mean, I've met him, I met the guy that you speak of and he is a, he is a cool, cool guy. Um, you know, there, there are legitimate relationships that are, you know, based off of love as opposed to, well, I just like a black female because they're good with sex. Or I just got – I've seen a lot of white guys get with other women, and uh, uh, other other uh, non-white women just because the sex was easy or they were easy or they could dominate the relationship. But then I've also seen equal balance. So I guess you're right. If you really honestly have 100% have to, then do it. But don't do it for the wrong reasons in my opinion. But anyway, go ahead, Bree. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I don't disagree with your points. So, someone who, <laughs> who who I respect a lot, who's talked a lot about this, is Sergeant Willie Pete. Um, goes by SWP. And I know a lot of people don't like him. Um, but I think he's actually <laughs> figured this thing out with the the interracial dating piece. Like I think that he's he has really understood kind of what's going on when it comes to interracial dating. Um it's something that you know, it's hard for me to avoid it, but I try not to talk too much about it because I feel like it's an argument that just gets circular and right. we don't get anywhere with it personally. Um, but it is important. And I said I can't get away from it because I do live in Minnesota. And here in Minnesota, the norm is <laughs> for a black relationship in the state of Minnesota is a quote unquote interracial relationship. And I hate saying that. I hate it. But it's because it's frustrating. But you will see a. I did it. It, yeah, I mean, and I, I was subject to it myself a couple times, but that's the that's the expectation here. Like, it's to the point where I have people who ask me if my wife is black. Like, like you shouldn't even have to ask such things. I'm pretty sure they don't ask white men if they're white, if their part, if their wife is white. But me, I get asked a lot: Is your wife black? Or, or, or especially, and, and <laughs> I don't like to do this, but when I work. And people want to see what my family looks like. They're always surprised to see what my wife looks like. They're like, oh, my goodness. She's so beautiful. It's like, goddamn right. She's beautiful. She's supposed to be ugly. <laughs> ugly? Really? <laughs> but but they're saying she's so beautiful because they don't expect her to be uh, black. Um, So I can't avoid it. But I, I try not to talk too much about it because I feel like we get caught in this relationship piece. And yep. it doesn't get us anywhere. It also, nope. if we look at the numbers, and I know statistics can be manipulated, but if we look at the numbers, uh, interracial relationships between black folks and others is very low. Uh, so when, when black folks do choose to get married, they do choose to get married to um, uh, black partners. Yes, yep. exotic. And another thing, Janice, too, um, it's not just this idea of having an exotic partner, especially for younger black people. I do a lot of work with uh, adolescents. 
right now the thing is foreign the word foreign and what that is it's it's just another extension it's just another generational take on this whole exotic factor so i deal with a lot of black men who want to have foreign women i deal with a lot of black females who want to be <laughs> foreign and they're from the hood you ain't foreign nothing but but that's but that's the thoughts is I want something foreign because we're that's another anti-blackness response. We want to get away from being black, so we better off saying that we're foreign. And I get a lot of that. And it's funny because you know, when I work with men and I work with I do a lot of men groups. Uh when I say adolescents, I'm talking 13 to 26. That's what I consider to be adolescents. And in my groups, I talk I always ask them what kind of girl you want. And a lot of times they say, I want a foreign chick. And here in Minnesota, it's not uncommon for them to say I want a white chick. And I when I when I when I ask them, I'm like, why? They can never tell me why. But then I say, okay, let's talk about these foreign chicks. What makes them foreign? And they talk about how you know they look good, they got long hair, they're handling their business, they respect men, all this other stuff, right? And then I say, okay, so you want a foreign chick, and chances are her language is not her first language is not English, right? They usually say, yeah, okay. Chances are she hasn't been in this country for very long, right? I say they say, yeah. What does she know about black men? Usually they talk about some sports or some entertainment. I'm like, okay. And I ask them, how are you in a position to get a foreign chick? And then they get quiet. I'm like, do you have a passport? No. Do you speak another language? No. Do you have a job to support yourself? Mm, not really. So I'm like, you ain't in no position to get no foreign women. So you living in a fantasy. And you keep working yep. in a fantasy. And and that fantasy is getting you nowhere. So you're talking all this foreign stuff. And I've been with foreign women. I've had a couple of women that were foreign. And then, guess what? I didn't marry one. You know why? Because I did not fit the expectation for what that foreign female's family would accept. And I'm a black man. I got three college degrees. You know, I tried to date Asian women in college, B. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't give a damn. They were like, no, no, no Negroes. He's American. No, oh, hell no. Yep. And that and that came from a, a Somali female. I dated mm. a Romanian chick. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I, I knew he was gonna say something. I dated another <laughs> chick that was Italian, and they was like, "Oh no, nope, not." Actually, I had a uh, Somali female, and I had a girl that was Eritrean, and and they were like, all four of them was like, "Nope, can't take you home, bro. Not gonna happen." Ain't gonna be able to do it, and that's because they had an intact culture, they had boundaries and expectations, and one of those boundaries and expectations was you were not gonna mess with no Negroes. Mm -hmm. And I that even though at the time I was in college or I was in grad school, I had I've always had a, I've had a job since I was pretty much twelve, but really fifteen years old. I've had stable import um, um, stable employment, but that that didn't matter to them because I was not acceptable within their culture which is very interesting to me so um so that happens that happens um <laughs> you cannot build a cake with using cornmeal and wheat flour that's right yes you can janice no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> yes you can't no just playing no you can't she's right <laughs> yes and and Janice is all and talking about the that pathology of this foreign concept it is about these good looks and it's also about being accepted into a community too um it's not just the good hair and the light skin eyes it's about um being accepted as a black person in the community one thing that I've learned and I've talked about this when I used to do a pot uh, um, a radio show called the Justice lab which I'm probably gonna repost a lot of them the shows we did like 30 shows man but we stopped doing it they were fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But one thing I talked oh, about, good. one thing I talked about is when you're in a quote unquote interracial relationship as a black man, and I and I'm willing to I actually should do a film on this because I'm willing to bet this is true. When you when you are in an interracial relationship as a black man, a black man or a black male, one thing that ends up happening is your blackness is validated. And what do I mean by that? When you're dating a, for instance, a white female, now I've I've been in a relationship with about three white females and other sexual interactions with a couple of others, and one thing that I've learned in those situations is I probably never felt more blacker <laughs> before being quote unquote <laughs> conscious than when I was with those white people because when I was with those white women, they they let me know that I was a black man, 
and that they yep. appreciated my black skin and they liked my black penis and they would say all these things that I'd never heard from anybody else and that, and that and that twisted pathology that twisted mentality was that was the first time my blackness was being validated and that was my conditioning that affirmation for me to be a black person and that was not right so a lot of it's these dudes right. who are seeking this validation from non-black women, they're seeking, they're trying to get their blackness validated. Finally, mm. finally, finally, this white woman, this, you know, this princess, this queen of milk magnesia is paying attention to me. She loves all my blackness. Oh, oh, she loves it. She loves my hair. She loves, you know, touching my beard. She loves my black skin. You it amazes me. Every white female that I had an interaction with has always told me, oh, your skin is so soft. And they would say just these things that make me just embrace who I was as a black man. That's some twisted ass mentality to have. That's twisted. Mm -hmm. But when you're a black person, you don't get that. Right. And this is what we see a lot of dudes complaining online. Tony Sotomayor and all these other fools when they're always talking about, you know, bed winches and all this other crap. All they're talking about is how black females have been conditioned to take a leadership role um, and to act upon in a matriarchy system. That's all they're complaining about. So a black female ain't going to tell you all that stuff. The white chick or the Asian chick's going to tell you that she ain't because she got too many other things to focus on. than talking about how soft your skin is or, <laughs> or how she loves your black penis. Like she got, she got time for all that. We got other things. Well, to handle. No, just kidding. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Now it happened. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it happened. But you got to be in a certain position for that stuff to happen. That doesn't happen all the time, man. And but when you're with a non-white person, they're more willing to say that stuff. And a lot of that stuff comes out of like porn and stuff too, man. Like you get all this interracial stuff, and they make you feel black. But it's 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 some twisted pathology. But I don't hear a lot of black males talking about how at when they have dated a non-black woman. That's when they finally have felt validated as a black man when they were able. And another twisted part of this, too, is that if you think about power and you think about men and we live in a world that's patriarchal, men run stuff. And that doesn't mean it's right. That doesn't mean that uh, I agree with it 100 percent. But men run things. And the only thing a black man runs, and I'm even willing to bet he barely runs this, is his penis. Black, the only thing a black man runs is his penis, where he can stick his penis. He doesn't run economics. He doesn't run politics. He doesn't run education. It's his penis and some of his possessions, such as cars and other trinkets, zapter, zapsters, as Mr. Nelly Fuller Jr. would say. So those mm -hmm. are the things that we pride ourselves on, our sexual prowess, our bodies, mm -hmm. our trinkets. Because that's where we seek our power in. And that and that's a messed up thing to have. So when a white female or a non-black female is telling you how she loves your penis or she can't wait to ride in your BMW with you or whatever the case may be, that makes you feel like a man, finally. You finally have felt like a man. That's a messed up mentality to have. And I've had it. Um, and I know that it's wrong now that I see that, you know, I understand what was going on. But before I'd ever, I didn't understand that. And I know folks are, at this point, they're like, how does this have to do with shootings and what's happened? All this stuff. Oh, wait, all, all this, this stuff has to deal with what's going on. All this is connected. All this is all of it. So when we talk about how we relate to each other on a sexual level, that affects that affects education, economics, labor, law, all this stuff. Because once we understand that when black males and black females can have a level of understanding of how we're going to come together, whether that's in a sexual uh, stance or non-sexual stance, then we're actually going to build families, period. And then once yep. we build families, we build communities. Once you build communities, then you can have institutions. This is the chain of, this is the chain of events that needs to happen. And when we don't do these things, we're going to keep bumping our damn heads over and over and yep. over again. Over and again. And then you're going to have the black, some black kids talking about all lives matter. Oh, oh what about black on black crime? They you know all that nonsense. And, and I don't, I don't necessarily <laughs> agree. I mean, I don't necessarily disagree with all. Um, not all that matter. I don't necessarily disagree with uh the fact that what about black on black crime? Because that's important too. Because if we can't fight, there's no war. <laughs> there's no. Let, let's not even go to war because most people ain't ready for military science. No, nope. there's no sports team. 
that can win a championship if they're arguing with their teammates. None. 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 If you're arguing with your teammates, if y'all don't have a flow, you're not going to win nothing. Not the Cavaliers, not the Golden State Warriors, not any football team. If you have a beef with your team, you're not going to win nothing. And that's mm. and our team is getting our butts kicked from end to end on the quarter of the field because we keep squabbling with each other. So And we keep destroying one another. And that's all a response to racism and white supremacy too. But if we continue to fight one another, black on black crime, which just services white supremacy, then we're going to continue to have nothing. Right. Yes. Yes. We definitely need to start having, seeing more value in our relationships and our families and in ourselves. That's one of the biggest things. I deal with a lot of people that don't value themselves. They don't give themselves credit. Yep. I have a social experience for everybody watching this. I have a social experiment. Somebody that you come in contact with in the next week that's black, ask them the last time that they felt loved. Or someone said that I love you. Ask them. Ask them, when's the last time someone told you that you love you? And make sure it's not a person that you have told that you love. But ask them, when's the last time someone told you that they loved you? You'll be surprised at the answers that I get when I ask people that. A lot of people can't tell you. And, and that means a lot when somebody else can tell you that they love you. That means a lot. And that goes into that goes into your self-worth as well because you know, I have a concept called the universal goal. And in that concept, I talk about the three things that people strive. People strive security, significance, and belonging. And security, and I'm putting this in my audio book that I'm going to drop on Monday, but security is less about being safe and more about being comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you think about this, um, like you think about a car, most modern cars have, most modern cars have, um, security alarm systems on there, right? So you get out your car, you hit your little thing, beep, beep, you're feeling good about yourself, but that doesn't stop anybody from stealing your car, right? But it makes you feel more comfortable that you hit that beep, beep on your car to make sure nobody goes in there. Or if somebody does, the alarm's gonna go off. Ain't gonna stop nobody from stealing your car. So really that's more about being comfortable than it is about being safe. The Mm -hmm. next level or the next area is significance. Significance is all about why do I matter? Why do I matter as a person? We all strive for this. Why do I matter? What's my purpose? What's my passion? What makes me significant in the world? Right? And this is what we see when people join gangs. This is what we see when people get in relationships. This is what we see with children. Everyone wants significance. Like my daughter who ran in here. Uh oh, am I freezing up? Like my daughter who ran in here. No, you're good. She wants to be significant. She's like, Daddy, what you down here doing? I need my attention. I don't care what you're doing. Pay attention to me. She's looking for significance at that moment. The next area is belonging. We all seek out belonging. And we're social beings. We're creatures. We all want belonging, right? And all this stuff is connected. All those three. Everybody strives for those three levels, those three things. It's called the universal goal. We all do that. Every every action we take is to satisfy one of those levels, if not all of those levels. So this is what we end up doing. So, yes, we definitely need to value ourselves as individuals and we have to value ourselves as a community and most of us don't because we are fed messages that we don't matter um you know being black is a negative bad thing non-constructive and we ain't nothing and we have to and for the folks that get that message we have to continue to promote what it's all about black love love that message um black children are are allowed to be happy all that stuff our community. You'll be amazed our... how many black children I deal with in families mm-hmm. that don't understand that they are allowed to be happy mm. and that they should be happy. Because a lot of black kids don't feel like they should be happy. They don't feel like they deserve to be happy. It's just, it is what it is. That's their condition. That's their situation. Exactly. That's their conditioning. So, I'm doing a lot of talking. Any questions? Any questions? And you can go ahead, Brian, and take it whatever direction you want to, my friend. No, I mean, like I said, I was just uh, – well, for one, is it, is, does a Troke X tip or Janice have any questions for us? Um, you know, going off of what you said, B. Jones, um, you know, like it, it, a lot of it is, you know, how, how it all ties back to all – how we're doing all the shootings and everything else – you know, we really have got to come back and as a as a group of people, you know, actually, I'll take that back. 
this has been going on my mind because so I was when I got home today and my parents were sitting out on the porch. Or actually, I went to go and just have dinner with them and they're sitting out on the porch. And I, the first thing, you know, I talked to my mom about it. Well, I was like, Mom, I saw that you had uh, talked about Brandon Jones's. Uh, um, uh, that you talked about Brandon Jones's post. And she said, you know, honey. I feel like hopefully that this would be the, these two moments. This kind of reminded me of like, perhaps we'll have that kind of like that Emmett Till effect, you know, right after people saw the bodies of Emmett Till or, you know, body of Emmett Till, that's when people really started waking up and saying, well, wait a minute, you know, should we continue to be second class citizens or should we fight that be, you know, right on the same, even though that, you know, where we are now, that's kind of significant, but back then, the moves that they, the moves that, you know, our ancestors and our, our, our parents and grandparents were making, they would, they felt that they were making a better life for all of us, you know, but they, you know, she basically explained to me that, you know, that, that perhaps this will be a wake up call in that, you know, we as a community need to come together, not just doing national elections, but politically de- definitely coming and being able to understand that, Hey, you know what? Officers such as the DA, that kind of stuff is the is elected. A lot of black people don't, you know, they they say, well, why did the DA let that guy go with a plea bargain? Uh, because he had no re- he had no repercussions for his actions. They, that that's something that we just do not have as a collective group. We can we can, I, I think we have the power to do so, but we haven't done that yet. Um, you know, so definitely coming together as a collective, definitely understanding our own self-worth and definitely understanding that not only that with our self-worth, you know, and connecting with other people, we can become a powerful force uh, is a good example or is a good um, thing to kind of follow. And I, I figure I feel that that's, you know, everything that you said, a lot of that, it comes back to, you know, our own selves and our own individuality. So. But we can go on with Janice's question. <laughs> the four-year-old in the car. <clears throat> okay, so this, so this is this is what hurts for me as a yep. father, as somebody who works very closely with young people, is the four-year-old, right? You know, I have a three-year-old daughter, um, so this hits home and. I hope that she's never in a position like that to see her father or or her stepfather or whatever the case may be. He was her dad. I'm going to just say her father. He was taking care of her, so he was her father. Um, had to go through that. And and just how calm the four-year-old girl was, how normalized it was, and how, how, how at four years old she had to comfort her mother. That's not a child's job to comfort their parent. That's the parent's job to comfort a child. But unfortunately... When you live in a system that is anti-black and that can exterminate and will exterminate black folks on various different levels, our children have to grow up fast and take on responsibilities that cognitively and developmentally they're not ready for. And at four years old, this girl has already picked up on those cues and understood that she needed to be there for her mom and everything was going to be okay. That hurts. It's very frustrating. Um, you know, she she now what she now requires is the love of her family and someone to break it down to her on a level that she can understand at four years old that she's not going to see her dad again. And she might already actually understand that, but she has to she needs comfort and she needs encouragement to keep moving forward. And she needs some honesty from her parents and her loved ones um, uh, in, of the world that she lives in. And when I say encouragement, encouragement to me is a huge thing for young people because, you know, from the school of therapy that I got trained in, it's called Adlerian therapy. And one of the big things that Alfred Adler had came up with was this concept of encouragement. And he says that encouragement to a child is like water to a tree. So we, we cannot, our children cannot grow without encouragement. And I add to that quote, and I say that not only is it encouragement is what our child, our children need, but they also need honesty. And even at four years old, she needs for the loved ones that are around her to be honest with her and let her know what's going on. 
at her level um Absolutely. which is very key is at her level like she doesn't need to she does never need to see this video until she's well into her adolescence but she does need to realize what happened um but this girl's been traumatized um unfortunately i would say she was probably she was probably traumatized before this incident and this was just another compound level to her trauma being a, a black female four years old she was probably born in trauma sounds like um the the fellow who was shot was not her biological father and since she did not have her biological father i think that that's a level of trauma in itself so this is just an unfortunate incident for the four-year-old and i pray that she gets the help that she needs and i also put out there on facebook if anyone knows this family um and if they're willing to do counseling uh, i am available for free um and i'll come to them so uh, i'm here to help um I do, i've done a lot of grief counseling um it's hard to explain things like this to a four-year-old, but she does need some intervention because she's grieving and she would continue to grieve. And, you know, her mom needs some assistance as well. Cause now her mom has yep. to live Absolutely. losing her, not only losing her partner and the parent to her child, ch her co-parent to her child, but also being in the presence of that. Like people don't understand how much trauma it is to hear gun, just to hear gunshots. Is traumatizing but to actually be not even a foot away from someone being murdered is extremely traumatizing in the I, car it does, man it doesn't matter man she was right there bro so no i'm saying i'm just saying it's loud like yeah yes yeah yeah the noise carries absolutely so the trauma that that whole family is experiencing is is you know times 10 compared to what the mom and the child are going to experience um but yeah i i hope that the response is is uh helping i know i know that uh, a program here locally called the kofi program they work for a foundation called wilder foundation uh they run the scene today in the protest and i trust the kofi program even though they're run by white folks i do have sure. some trust i know a lot of <laughs> folks that work for kofi um i think that they do excellent mental health um work and i, I think that they might be in contact with this family i hope that they are if they're not you know i'm here free of charge um I'm just waiting to get the call. I, I, I've learned through Facebook today that I'm connected to these people through a couple of other folks, but I don't want to impede on their pain at the moment. But I did want to put it out there that I am available to help if necessary. Um, the next question. Now, what of the pathology of an adult who would shoot into a car with a young child in the backseat? <laughs> um. Dr. Bobby Wright, Bobby E. Wright, wrote a great book. It's very short. It's like 30 pages, it's, but it's a great book called Menticide. And um, within the book, he talks about psychopathic racial. Uh, oh, man, I'm going to mess it up. Psychopathic racial disorder. Oh, man. Anyway, he pretty much what he's talking about is how crazy these people are. And when we talk about the pathology of someone who's willing to fire a gun in a car with three people it doesn't matter if there's a, i mean it does matter that there was a child in there but shoot a gun into a car with three people not knowing what's gonna happen that's gonna not knowing what's gonna happen is wild it's wild these people don't have any regards for black people's lives period um uh -huh. nope. So we can talk about Black Lives Matter, and that's great, and it's true. But to to take your to take a weapon and to just fire, I mean, it it does. I mean, what what other pathology do you want me to say? <laughs> I mean, it's it's beyond pathology. That guy, that guy was crazy. It's, in, it's not about being crazy, man. It's about being a white supremacist and being able to do what you want because you have the power that you can do it. That doesn't mean you're crazy. That means that you are backed by a system that allows you to do what the hell you want. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And how the hell you want to do it. I'm his not actions, gonna give, his actions I'm not gonna give the people I'm not gonna give nobody I'm not gonna give nobody the label of crazy. I worked in a psych ward. I didn't say he was crazy. I said that his actions were crazy. I'm not gonna give him that either. I live in a psych ward. I, I worked in a psych I lived in a psych ward. It felt like I lived there. I worked in a psych ward, a legit level five psych ward for two years. I know what crazy looks like. That ain't crazy. 
That ain't crazy. That's somebody doing something that they know that they can do because they can do it and that there's not going to be any riches. And there's going to be riches behind, behind the uh, rainbow for that guy, for killing a black guy. I mean, it is what Possibly. it is. Possibly. But, but even less than that, there's no repercussions. Yeah, right. No there's, no repercu- there's no repercussions. Um. Ah, oh man. I had nothing, I had something else that I wanted to say about that. Lost my train of thought. Go ahead. Go ahead. I lost my train of thought. No, I was just going to say, I, I completely agree. You know, it's, you're right. He's not crazy. He knew exactly what was, he knew exactly that, that there was a system that would, would protect him. Unfortunately, you know, and that, so, so somebody had posted up of a, uh, an article today. Apparently uh, it was in uh, at UCLA or something. Some, some 19 year old white student was, was killed by a police officer and someone said, oh, crap, well, and the post, well, someone on the post commented that saying, oh, crap, well, you know, it's not just a white or black thing. You know, it, it's all of us. We all have to, you know, uh, be on the lookout. My thoughts to that was, well, no, the difference between wh- whenever a white, a white person is killed unjustly, there is a there is justice. Th- there is always justice uh, against the person that did the killing. When it comes, especially if it's a police officer, because there's a, there's political, there's, you know, like I said, a social, um, there's a social uh, position for that, for them to be able to receive that justice. Now, whenever it comes with us, right, we, let's, for example, the whole Peter Lang case up in New York, in New York upstate New York. I forgot, uh, Akai, Akai, Akai Gurley, excuse me. Yeah. The whole yeah. Akai, Akai Gurley uh, the with that Peter Lane, okay? Yes, the agents paid off the, uh, the the prosecutor up there, but the thing is, for them, for him to even, or for the prosecutor to even consider telling people, even though this guy, this man was convicted of murder, to say, well, we're just gonna, I just want to pro- give him probation. I mean, what? Like I said, that is just the, it's a sick system. People, are, you can tell uh, that case especially showed how many people are actually bought and paid for <laughs> uh, with this system. And I mean, it made me wonder if, if we could ever wield that kind of power. Well, right now we're, we're, we're actually not in that kind of position to come to get, to come together as a pact. And uh, now we have the money to do so. I'm just saying as of right now, not to say we're not going to do it as of right now, we don't have that position for us to come together as a pact and to say, so a prosecutor, hey man, you know what? I'm looking at what you're doing. Let this fool walk, and if he does, we're gonna put somebody else in there that can convict another, the next person. Right. That puts fear in a lot of. Uh, like I said, my mom told me today, DA, and it's true. DAs are elected officials. They don't control. Mm-hmm. They don't run anything. They can bring justice. The thing is, if the, and, and these cop killings. These killings of, of black of, of black people unjustly, they do it because they know that there's that there's like you said, Brandon, that there is a system that is going to protect them. Now, oh. to infiltrate that system, it need, it requires us to come together and to like super pack, create a super pack and put a candidate in there that will be for us. And that doesn't mean going to, to Congress or I mean, it can you can do that. Senate, Congress, fine. But we're talking about local governments here, your judges, your, you know, your chief of police, your D.A. That's what that that's what that requires. They're not going to fear us. They don't fear us as a community right now. They're, they're, they're saying, oh, look at them. They're getting drunk, running around, wanting <laughs> foreigns. You know, they don't care about what's going on. And we'll, I'll kill him. So what? I'll kill him on videotape. OK. Yeah. And I'll say that he had a gun when he didn't have a gun in his hand. And I'll say that there, that justice was served when the guy when the cop got on probation. Mm-hmm. What are you gonna do about it? No repercussions, none. One of the one of the notions that I battle with is this notion of white people being scared of black people. I really struggle with this because I don't know if that's necessarily true. But then that part of me thinks that it's true. I I I don't have the answer for this one. And the reason why I battle with this is I don't think that they fear us. And I see black people say that all the time. They're scared of us because we're black. But 
that doesn't stop them from doing what they do, right? Nope. But at the same time, you know, I so I think of this is a bad comparison, but I'm just gonna go for it anyway, right? So my wife, my wife is terrified of spiders. She's scared of spiders. I don't know if it's arachnophobia or what, but if you see a spider, she's out. Like, she's gone. She don't try to kill the spider. She'll get me to do it. She'll tell, you know, she will she won't go in the room if she's by herself. She'll be like, there's a spider in the road. I ain't going back up there. Like, she's scared. She's legit scared of spiders, right? So when people are generally scared of stuff, they avoid it. That's That's been my experience. They don't exterminate it. I believe that they don't give a damn about us. So that's why <laughs> things can happen. And there's no consequences for when these things happen. You know, like, I don't think that the white officer that shot Tamir Rice was scared of him. I don't think, like, he was not scared of Tamir Rice. He rolled up and just, boom. <laughs> that was that. I mean, the boy was just playing in a park, man. I don't think that nobody was scared of him. I think they just... It's like I do what I want to do. I don't give a damn about you. Boom, blow you out away. Blow you away. I don't know if that's necessarily fear, man. I, you know, I don't. I know that Doctor Wellsing talks about genetic and the fear of you know genetic annihilation, and and I think that that might be legit. Now that's I think, I think that, it's a real fear. No, I don't disagree with that. But what I'm saying is. She wrote that in the 70s and she studied that stuff in the 60s. I think that we have evolved to another level of that type of mentality and pathology where it's not necessarily just the genetic piece. It's just this piece that we don't give a damn. Like we, we've we been going at this so long that it don't even matter no more. So I don't think that they necessarily scare us or they're scared of us Um on a collective level. Let me say that. Cause I have been around some white folks that have legit been terrified to be around me, but it's usually on a one-on-one -on -one level. But when they're in a collective group or they're backed by an institution, like the police are, I don't think they're scared of you. I think they're, they're, they're just responding and doing what they think is necessarily good, which is to exterminate you like a spider a roach or any other insect. There's a piece of this, it, of that system. Right. Th that's a part of the culture. <laughs> Dominate. Dominate, destroy, confuse. That's it. That's what they do. Can, I mean, it reminds me of uh, the show House of Cards, right? I like the show. I think that they, I think that, that show... Oh, it's a fantastic. And the reason why I like it is because it really lets you get inside the mind of white people. Like, it, yep. I mean, it's a fascinating show to watch, like, how white people manipulate and get power. Now, now a lot of it is based on fiction, but, man, I mean, it just, wow. Like, you cannot watch that show and not just be like, damn, this is some interesting stuff. Like, this is how they operate. But one thing that Frank Underwood said in, like, season two was right before he got the presidency. He was in the limousine and he did one of his classic monologues where he looks in the camera and starts talking. And he has said the road to power is paved by lies and hypocrisy. And I was just like, boom, like that quote right there was just so on point. The road to power is paved by lies and hypocrisy because that is what the system, uh, this is what the refined system of racism, and white supremacy is built on. I talked a lot about the game Two Truths and a Lie. White people love this game. It's called Two Truths and a Lie. A lot of younger white people play it on college campuses and stuff. That's where I learned about it. And in this game, I mean, it's pretty much the title of the game tells you what the game is about. They'll tell you two truths, and then they'll tell you a lie that sounds so good. It sounds like the truth, and you have to decipher of the three things that you were told, which one is the which lie. Is the lie. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's how they operate, Two Truths and a Lie. So when you see these white folks out here at the Black Lives Matter <laughs> protests, <laughs> when you hear the governor come out and say the things that the governor says, you know, you, you be be pay attention because you might be a part of a game of two truths and a lie and might not even know it. Now, do I think that there are some white folks that are genuine? I do. I, I, I honestly, you know, I can't say that I don't because I really think that some of them are truly trying. I but it ain't a lot of them, but it's so like I can think of three of them on top of my head that are truly nice. Trying. But that's it. That's not, I mean, that's not nice. That's awful, really. If we're talking about dismantling the system, I can think about three of them that are really, they really, really try. They really try. But 
I, as a black man that has some awareness and honesty about what's going on, I cannot 100% trust them because I understand that they play two truths and a lie. That's how their culture is. That's how they operate. Two truths and a lie. So power, the Frank Underwood, if I can find this quote, I'll make a meme of it. He said, the road to power is paved by lies and deception. I was like, whoa. That was crazy. But anyway, I don't know how I got on that tangent. Um, there was another question. I think that it's resentment in the age of Obama age. I think that it is uh, irrational disdain and hatred. Absolutely. Absolutely it's resentment in the Obama age. And we got to understand that the, 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 the seat or the position of being a president is a symbol. It's a symbol of the most powerful nation in the world, the most powerful nation. Um, economy and military in the world and when you put a black face in front of that and not a white face that's saying that the most powerful nation and military and economic system in the world is operated by a black man and even if people don't really understand how politics works that's how the majority of folks white folks see the world is Obama so they don't like that they can't wait for him to get out of here they can't wait for November they can't wait and, and that has created a lot of tension. That has created a lot of tension, mm-hmm. a lot of response, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger. And this is why folks like Donald Trump can have so much success in their political run because of that. And we've seen it. We've seen the first president, 2008, gun sales go up, 2012, gun sales go up again. Like, we see we see it. We know, we know that it's there. It's resentment. You know, it's irrational disdain, absolutely. Is it hatred? Absolutely. But it, all those things are built into the culture because if they don't have that, they feel like they're out of control. And when they're out of control, that's when they start getting aggressive. And that's what we're seeing now. That's what we're seeing now because they feel like they're not in control, even though when they are, even though they completely are in control. It doesn't matter because what we what we know. And if we're going to be honest, belief is more power to, powerful than facts. Belief is more powerful than facts. And if they believe that they are not in control, it doesn't matter if they are or not, they're going to react because the belief is more powerful powerful than facts. So absolutely, gonna they're going to continue to do these things. They're going to continue to do these things. Because so once they feel, and this is part of white culture, not, not European culture, white culture. This is, this is across the board. <laughs> this is around the world. When they are not in control of something, they lose their damn minds. Damn go, minds. Go look. I mean, you can look at you can look at this on a micro level. Go watch little white kids when they're at the park, and they can't do something that they want to do. They lose their damn minds. They lose it. They just flipping out, cussing out. Fuck you, mom! It's like they just go crazy. They go. It's like that stick right up in the ass. <laughs> they 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 lose it, man. They lose it because once they lose control. Once they lose control, they literally lose it. And and this system operates on that. That's why we get propaganda. That's why we go through this whole circus of elections and all these things, because this just feeds into that system to keep things going. But once that once that is, you know, once they feel like they're out of control, man, you're gonna we're gonna see all types of crazy stuff. That's why these Trump rallies are off the chain. Because these people feel like they are, they are getting, they're getting fed all this stuff that they're out of, con- like, <laughs> like, we got to get this Negro out the White House and we're taking this back. They're getting all rallied up because they feel like they're not in control. So they're doing everything in their power to get back in control. And then they just start wilding out. Like, it's, man, when you look at the psychology of these people, you'll be a man. You're like, what the hell is going on? And Dude, we, see, right? we see it every day. We go to work with those fools. <laughs> man, I mean, I got workplace stories all day, man. Like, <laughs> man, I'm I'm not even gonna go there right now. But yes, once they feel like they're out of control, once they have the the high the notion that they're out of control, they just start flipping out. Uh, in so many ways, is it behavior of those who are taught there are no boundaries? Hmm, yeah, I would say so. And, and you know, when you're in control of a system or you believe that you're in control of a system, you dictate what the boundaries are. And when you feel like you dictate what the boundaries are, you do what you want to do. That's why cops can shoot people on camera, off camera, take off cameras. doesn't matter. They do what they want because they feel like they're in control. They're backed by a system that creates the boundaries. 
So boundaries are important. And this is why I preach that as individuals, we have to make sure that a part of our code is by building balance and boundaries, because if we don't have them ourselves, we get in awful situations. Yeah, in awful situations. Right, right. Yeah. Any other questions for the folks that are hanging out with us tonight? Um, or anything from you, Brian? We're probably going to go for another 10 minutes or so. Anything else? Well, I mean, like I said, like, you you know, going off about everything that you've, that you've spoken to, uh, what, what would you say, because um, I've seen a lot of posts from non-black people today say, I don't know what to really think about this situation. I've even seen, or I don't, I really can't relate, which you can't, but I mean, you know, I've, I've really seen, I've also seen posts from black people that say, hey, white friend, if you don't understand what's going on, grab a black friend and have go to lunch with the them and ask them questions. What the hell? I wanted to be like, what the, what? I'd be terrified if somebody said, hi, my black friend. I mean, really? <laughs> I wouldn't be terrified, but I'd be sitting there like, "Where? No, I, I would have blocked them." <laughs> but anyway, how would I, what, what what would you think is like, you know, how how should people kind of to those to those kind of posts? Like, what would you say to those kind of people? <sighs> Man, it's another one I'm kind of twisted on because I uh, white folks always want to talk to me about racism, which just blows my mind. Um, I don't believe that that's going to solve this problem. I don't. I don't believe grabbing your black friend and going to lunch to talk about their problem is going to solve anything. I think that's a joke. Um, because we've been talking for a long ass time and I don't know what else we need to talk about. Like, <laughs> what are we talking about at this point? Um, what do you want me to explain how frustrated I am? Do you want me to explain how scared I am? Do you want me to explain how... You know, I can't stand you, or you're cool, but everybody else I don't like. Like, what do you want yeah. me to exactly? No, say? exactly, exactly. I just was. I'm sorry, B. I was just pushed. I was like, yeah. oh, I wanted an opinion on that. I was frustrated by some of these people. You know, some of us that get on there. Oh my gosh, this is th- this is hitting us too close to home. What? Like, th- th- there shouldn't be th- this. White supremacy doesn't exist. No, no, no. We, you know. You're, like I said, uh, when you know the game, you're not surprised of, of whatever kind of results or things that could happen. But to those others that want to put their head in the sand, you know, they're they're over here saying, "Hey, you know, well, we have to we we should we should make our make our white friends understand how we how we feel." No, I don't I don't need to for what? Like, I, and I, I'm not sure if that's a that's one of those you know validations that we seek but i i don't know i've I've seen a bunch of that it is <laughs> it is a validation that we seek because it makes us feel good it's, it's the same thing i said with the black males and uh having sex with non-black women it's the same thing it's like okay you want to talk to me white person you want to talk to me about my oppression my subjugation as a black person i would love to do that but that doesn't solve the problem see like we've been conditioned to seek out that validation. It'll do us better if we got together and talked to amongst each other about what we're gonna do than it would for me to go and have Starbucks with Becky and Roger. Like that like that's <laughs> what? That's not gonna save anything. That's not gonna that's not gonna help that's not gonna help anything. Now, do we need to have those conversations with white folks? Sure, but I my belief is this. When we're talking to white folks that are willing to hear what we got to say, we're speaking to the choir because those white folks have already decided that, okay, I understand that I benefit from this system. I don't like it. Um, Let me hear what this person has to say. That's speaking to the choir, right? And then if you're not speaking to the choir and you're talking to someone who's trying to seek knowledge, it's not my job to educate you on how you abuse me. That's another thing. That's not my job. That's like asking a rape victim to go talk to rapist. No, thank you. <laughs> Speaking of this, going back to this, what? It, 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 let's just put it this way: if if you could have dinner with the family that enslaved your family, would you go do that at the in the plantation still standing? 
It's a weird question, bro. Um, there's a med aid. That's a question to me. It's a now go ahead. I I'll, I'll get there, to what I go have there with the family that enslaved my family. Yes. No, thank you. No. Okay. There was a dude. This is why I asked. The black dude. I saw this story peeping around last a couple uh, about a couple days ago. That was in South Carolina. He gets a call from the <laughs> grand the, the cousin or the, no, no, I'm sorry, from one of the grandchildren of the slave owners of his people. Now, granted, this white guy called him. They they still the plantation's still there, and I think it's an attraction in South Carolina. Okay, oh, so this white guy had this white family. His family, and his family benefited oh, economically man. from all of that. They still do. They still have the the slave huts. They still have the slave huts that are back there. This wow. black guy and he took his family up there for a weekend, sat down, <laughs> had a meal with oh, this dude. God. Turns out that this guy is cousin. They're cousins. Sure, of course. Because what happened was. The slave master had raped this dude's grand grandmother. It's rape, okay? It, it isn't. Well, they had relations. No, she had no choice. It was right. rape, right. okay? And then yeah. that started his family. I'm like, dude, what? Wow. If y'all ain't talking about reparations or breaking bread, what are you talking to him about? Oh well, wow. this is just good. You came from one side of the tracks. He's living up on a whole another side. What the heck? What what are you what are you talking to him about? What are you oh well our family was so great. Yeah, you know, we could learn from each other. No, I, I want to know how much money how much <laughs> have you made off of this? Our you said you enslaved uh, my family. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I, yeah. I, I'm surprised I didn't <laughs> see that. So I have Google alerts and I, I get Google alerts on stuff like racism, black mental health, you know, all these other things that I get alerts. So I, I did not come across that information. It was the but, day before yeah. that whole shooting went down, Brandon. And that's and that's probably <laughs> why it just got cl you know flooded yeah. with other stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I don't think I could do that. Um, personally, I don't think that I could go doing that. And it's it's funny because it reminds me. So back in 2011, it was an interesting year for me, man. A lot of stuff was going on. But back in 2011, <laughs> uh, I had a family reunion, and my family, my my mother's side of the family comes from a small town called Danville, Illinois, which is, is it's on the border of Illinois and Indiana. Mm. Um, it's an old uh, kind of steel mill type of town that, that still looks like how it did back in the 60s and 70s, which is crazy. Um, and when we went there, the oldest living member of my maternal family was my grandfather, my great grandfather's brother, and they did a cotton swab for the ancestry stuff. So they did the um, we did an ancestry check, right? And the, the the results came back, and it said that we were descendants from Ethiopians and Irish, right? So Ethiopians and Irish were the two genetic links that we had, right? Now we did this. My family did this. I didn't have any part of this. I was so clue. I didn't even know they did this until we had the little family barbecue. And after they revealed all this, they broke out this Irish flag. And then the next day we had an Irish Mills. Like so <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. I ain't lying, bro. What y'all think is no bro? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not Excuse lying, me. bro. I'm sorry. Now I'm my sorry. last name is Jones. So I mean, and that's not my that's not my mother's maiden name or my grandmother's maiden name either, but but that's an Irish last name. But anyway, so, so yeah, so we had this Irish feast, and I'm sitting, and remember, earlier in this blab, I was talking about how at this point in time, I was just starting to become more conscious, and I was paying attention to stuff, so I was pissed. And I told my my fiance at the time, like, dude, we gotta go. Like, I can't deal with this. Like, my blood pressure's getting high. You know, we're parading this Irish flag around. We ain't paid no attention to the Ethiopian stuff that we that we learned. I'm like, what the what the hell is going on? And it just frustrated me. But once again, it gets back to what we talked about earlier in this blab, seeking white validation. And when we seek white validation, things get things get messy. Logic goes out the window, bro. When you want to feel good, when we when you want to feel good, logic goes out the window. 
Logic goes out the window. It reminds me of that window. leprechaun uh, film in uh, the Alabama. <laughs> Alabama. <laughs> with the with the black guy that walking up the street with the with the he's like he's suited from head to toe. Yeah, this is a leprechaun flute from my great great grandfather. He was Irish. Oh, and it was a, it was a, it was a crack pipe. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm about to drop that link, man, because I just watched that couple like on a week ago. That is oh <laughs> that's what that sounds. So I'm sorry, man. When you told me about your family, I was like, man, that's what that shit sound like. <laughs> oh man, let me put that in <laughs> the here. Irish just, flag. <laughs> just for folks that aren't familiar. Oh you know, geez. hey, you know Henry Cape got Irish in him. Oh, I'm not. I, I have no comments. <laughs> no, he, he I, went there. I mean, I saw. I saw it on PBS. He actually went. I, there. I'm sure. I I just ain't gonna go there. I just ain't gonna go there. I know. I know. <laughs> oh, that's whack. So, oh man, I can't. So I, I can't show the video because it won't show it off. It won't show in the archives, but it will show live. Oh, Doctor Vibe is in the building. Hey, Doctor Vibe, we're getting ready to sign off. Unfortunately. Um, but it's good to see you see you here. So this is the video talking about. We're gonna watch this, comment on this, and then we're gonna wrap it up for tonight. This is crazy. <laughs> Little humor for all the uh, serious stuff that's been going on. That guy. <laughs> this guy, yes. <laughs> His smile. All right, that's not a part of the original video. I don't know what this is. <laughs> what? Okay, this is it. Okay, this is going back, yeah. All right, this is not part of the original video either. No, it is. It is. No, it's this a... is not part of the original video. Oh, that's video. tough. Somebody threw this in there. All right, whenever this gets off, we're going to see the, the validation piece coming up right here. Here it is. Hopefully. Hey, your mom's in the house, B. Jones. Yeah, I seen her. <laughs> I don't know what this is. Man, all right, all right, all right. We're cool. Yeah. Because he this messed it up. Funny, no, this part's funny. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best, though. The go. All right. So, anyway, just to add a little bit of more, I, I don't know if that was constructive or not, but it goes to show <laughs> that funny. validation. It goes to show that validation, right? You talk about, you know, he got this flute from his ancestors. That it's just like, what? And, and then on? he's like directing traffic. It's like, well, dude, what do you do during the day? <laughs> <laughs> Direct seeks out leprechauns, man. Hey, it is what it is. Okay, all right. So, yes. So apparently there were four, there were four cops that were shot, um, in Dallas. One fatality. Uh, it's gonna wow. be very interesting. It's, yeah, it's gonna be very interesting to see what uh further information comes out from this. Um, it happened at a at a protest. Uh, I don't know who was doing the shooting. Was it someone shooting within the Black Lives Matter group? Someone shooting at the Black Lives Matter group? 
It'd be very, very interesting to see kind of what the response oh, is going to be. This is good. This. Oh, this is not good. Um, so we might have to come back tomorrow night and uh, and discuss this because this happened. This happened here when we had the Jordan Clark shooting. Um, when he got shot over in Minneapolis, we had protests going on, and there was a group of white folks, and they Facebook Live that they're coming to cause trouble, and they shot up into the crowd, and they hit a few folks, and they didn't get any repercussions. They all got off. This happened just last year with Jordan Clark. So there's going to be more of this, unfortunately. Oh, black gosh, folks. crap. Why do they have to hit the police, though? God dang it. I don't, I don't, but like I said, I'm not saying that it was, I'm not, I don't know who, d- who did the shooting. It's not clear at the moment, but as more details come out, it's going to be very interesting to see what, what actually has happened and where were these shots you know, coming from was this from within the group to the cops? Was this from the cops or was this from vigilantes to the, you know to the protesters or whichever direction? It's going to be very interesting to see how this gets spun. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to talk too much about it, but if you're going to be protesting, be very vigilant, be very careful, and and honestly, I would not have my children out there. I'm sorry. No, nope. I would not have my children. I've seen a couple of folks that I know, a couple of my family members, bringing their babies out to the protest. These are dangerous times, and it calls for serious security measures. So if you want to protest, you got you need to do it as an adult. Do not have your babies out there. Keep your babies safe, but keep them informed at the same time. I know that we talked about a lot of different things on today's blab, but there will be more blabs from myself and hopefully for Brian if he's available. We need to keep putting out constructive information as much as possible because we are in dangerous times as black people. And as black men, I charge us with the responsibility and accountability to put our community where it needs to be because if we ain't going to do it, it ain't going to get done. So any final words from you, Brian? Look, um, just kind of looking into um, some of the things that these are some crazy times, crazy, crazy days that have been, you know, but it's, Honestly, it's not not surprising to us. I mean, we've got to be very vigilant. We've got to wake up to racism, white supremacy. We have got to understand what it is and how it works and how it is being intertwined uh, in our society and, and in our lives. But we've also got to learn how to, you know, how to ha- have a uh, a counter to to the to the system. Um, going back to the shots in Dallas, I'm, um, it's it's a uh, yeah, we, we've got to keep, we've got to, we've, we've definitely got to keep monitoring the story. You know, it, it some, a, a lot of people are saying, I, I was looking through the uh, Dave space of sphere. Of course, you've got the white people saying, Oh, well, this is just unnecessary. I know you're mad, but the, you, you shouldn't have had to shoot three cops. But then you've got other the black people where, you know, we got to peep that game though. Somebody said, I smell a fabricated, a fabricated narrative coming around. Or that somebody said, or another person said, they think it's they're, they're, they keep looking at this garage, this uh, this parking garage that that they're thinking that's where the shots might have came from. But I don't, I don't think, it, I don't know. We've we we definitely got to see how the media is going to spin this. You know, the white supremacy media. What's good, and and we got to definitely got to continue to keep in the to keep in the forefront these two brothers that were killed. Uh, unjustly because what's going to end up happening is and they're going to try to do this they're going to push this sto- this this story now in the forefront and say well you know as you see what's going on blue lives yeah. matter you know yeah. blah blah yeah. blah why are these black people ro- go over here and they're going to blame us because first of all they're not going to find these people watch they're going to find them but they're going to sit up there and think it was us okay just like they did when that shot and the cop got killed right up the street uh at Sergeant Goforth, they found that fool to be uh, having an affair with a Becky, and then the guy that blew his brain, blew that guy's brains out, um, was the, Becky's boyfriend, the black guy. He was the boyfriend of Becky. So hey, okay, th- this is this is what they're gonna do. We've got to be very vigilant because cops are. I mean, and, and if I know that, da- if I know the area of Dallas. You know, this is where McKinney, where that whole McKinney stuff was. McKinney's mm-hmm. just 30 minutes outside of Dallas. Those people, those are race soldiers all up in there. They're everywhere. But if I know anything about Dallas, they're going to be on the war path. Okay? They're going to – you've got to be careful. Everybody's got to be careful wherever you are. Okay? Know that you – know, you know, like I said, stay vigilant. And also, I think it's weird that 
that movie, The Purge, came, just came out. I haven't seen it yet, but it would be interesting if if what if, if it parallels what is exactly going on to to right now, um, in that movie. The the past movies have been like that, but yeah, anyway. that's what I was about to say. If you've seen the last two, the past movies have been like that exactly. It's given a lot of is maybe we should do a blab just on those two movies, man. Because man, ooh. Boy. The second one was the best though, because that's how black people need to be. We need to get together, and that they showed you what you need to do. Get your butt <laughs> together and and counter revolutionize that stuff. Right. So yeah, um, I said, we but that's my final two, word. Ten minutes ago. <laughs> so I'm seeing, I'm already seeing a lot of folks talking about this. The uprising has begun. This is what happened when you push black people too far. We don't even know any details about the shoot. We don't know if the people who are shoot were black or not. Be very careful with what you're posting and what you're saying because it can come back to hurt you. And this goes for myself included. I stand by my words as Brandon Jones. Brian stands by his own words. Hopefully we have said something tonight that has been constructive and has actually provoked some thought for you and hopefully will provoke some actions from you as well. Feel free to hit me up at Universal Jones on Twitter. You can connect with me on Facebook if you're not already connect with me. You can also check me out on my website, jegnainstitute.com. That's J-E-G-N-A-I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T.com, jegnainstitute.com. You can just type in Jegna in Google. You should be able to find me. So you want to leave any contact info for you? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, definitely, you can hit me up at um, on Twitter at bke87. Um, I'm mostly on majority of the time. I'm on Facebook, uh, Brian Keith Edwards, and it's Brian spelled with a uh, an I B R I A N K E I T H Edwards E D W A R D S profile pic with my fiance. You know, black love. We got it going. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, I mean, I do have an Instagram, but I'm really not on it. So, but that's that's those are definitely uh ways to hit me up so awesome black first (laughs) black first and as always be safe be constructive produce justice peace peace